Chapter 56 Getting to F Plus Rank Outside the dungeon, Amelia was chatting with Emmy because Lucas and Livia were still resting in the temporary camp that had been set up for them. When do you think he will come back? Amelia asked as she ate a snack. It's an exploration type dungeon, so maybe young master will take his time exploring four to five caves before coming back. Emmy replied. Really? I mean, he was quite good during the duel, but fighting F rank monsters would take a toll on him, Amelia said while chewing on her snack. Amelia was quite comfortable with Emmy because, growing up, Emmy filled the spot of an elder sibling for her. She was like a big sister to Amelia, and Emmy would be her choice whenever she needed advice about anything. This was also the reason why Emmy made a blunder of not reporting Amelia coming together with the twins. Her perspective of Amelia was greatly different from Asher's. Young Master defeated around 10 G-rank wolves when he was a G-rank, and I believe he can do this much after his training, Emmy said proudly. Hum, you are quite proud of him, Amelia said as she squinted her eyes a bit. Of course, Emmy immediately replied. Humph, he is just a mean bastard. I can't understand how you and Damien even stay around him all the time. Amelia said annoyingly. Well, I think young master might act a bit cold and not like others around his age, but... Emmy was speaking when the safety device made a noise, alerting everyone present. Everyone, we are going in. Search for young master quickly. Emmy commanded as she dashed towards the dungeon gate. Following her, several guards also disappeared into the dungeon gate. Not all guards followed her as they needed to be there to protect Amelia and the twins who were still sleeping in their tents. I hope he is fine, Amelia said as she looked at the dungeon gate. One hour ago, inside the dungeon, Asher was still getting comfortable with his new sword art. His movements were getting more refined as he followed the scriptures that he remembered seeing. Hmm, the penalty is not as strict as I thought, Asher said to himself. Asher knew that he was getting better at the sword art and completing the first mastery alone would be a great challenge for anybody who was new to swords. This meant that just like he retained his knowledge of basic swordsmanship, he still had his old instincts, which helped him correct his movements several times he imagined battling an enemy. System, will the features that were sealed be unlocked? Asher worded his question in a way that the system could answer him. Host can unlock it, but if the host wants to know anything other than this— you don't have enough authority right now. Asher continued his training as he got the answer he needed. It was not that he needed the features that were sealed. He was sure that his own knowledge was enough for him to carry out his plans. But he knew that whatever the system could have offered him would have been quite valuable. He knew that going forward, the future would change a lot, and more variables would appear that could hinder him. I still cannot remember the next scripture. Asher stopped as he noticed that his mastery would not increase any further than this right now. He needed some time for his mind to stabilize what he had just learned and master it fully to move any further. Getting ripped off of his sword art considerably weakened him. He was a swordsman in his previous life as well, and doping his mana to forcefully increase his ranks made him unable to become a mage. Asher's bloodline ability would have made him a great mage if he had taken a natural path to increase his strength. Asher was currently in F rank and could feel he would soon become an F plus rank. His body was still in the process of consolidating his E rank mana core completely with his body. This was also the reason Asher did not try any man related techniques that would burden his body. And now, after his new sword art, he was unable to recall them. He also did not learn any mage related spells because he knew that learning them in the World Academy would be more beneficial for him. During his consolidation period, he could focus on his sword. His knowledge of spells was only limited to some spells which he learned during his stay at the World Academy. Hmm, should I try the first method? Asher questioned himself. He vaguely remembered his mana doping methods as they were strongly integrated into his sword art. He wanted to test if he could replicate them now. Also, the fact that his bloodline ability had changed made him question if the new limits he could handle now were lower or higher than before. Asher hesitated for a moment before deciding to try replicating his mana doping methods. He closed his eyes and focused on his mana core, 
feeling the flow of mana within him. He then tried to manipulate the flow of mana, pushing it beyond its natural limits. As he did so, he felt a surge of power coursing through his body. However, he also felt a sharp pain in his chest, as if his body couldn't handle the strain. He could feel the mana resisting him, not wanting to follow the directions he wanted it to move. This was vastly different from mana circulation techniques because he was forcing the mana to move outside the mana veins, and doing this was the same as injuring someone with a mana-coated dagger. But Asher had found a way to strengthen his body by making his mana veins even stronger after damaging and healing them at the same rate. He was making his core forcefully extract the mana to damage himself, and making sure the mana did not go wild inside his body carefully maintaining the amount he was forcing outside the mana veins. This meant he was forcefully consolidating his body to his mana, while at the same time trying to strengthen the amount his mana veins could handle by making them go through a process of repairing after injuring them. His first method was not that harmful to him the first time, but repeating this would have damaged his core a little bit, and he could only replicate it because of his passive skill that allowed him a certain amount of mana manipulation inside his body. Warning host is advised to stop. Asher ignored the system, knowing that this much harm would heal in a month or so completely. This method for the first time would not give him a permanent injury that would not heal. Warning host is advised to stop. Warning host is advised to stop. Mana around his body was going rampant, and this made the security bracelet activate itself as the mana it was reading outside the mana veins counted as a critical injury. The one who invented this safety device never considered someone who would harm themselves to such degrees to increase their power. Cough. Asher spurted blood and got on his knees. The rebound he received from this made him feel weak. Cough, it seems that I cannot use this method in my current condition. Asher said as he saw the blood he coughed on the ground. F plus rank. Asher could feel that he had ranked up to the peak of the F rank and his injuries were not too critical as well. He only did this because currently, his mana core rank was higher than his current rank, and he estimated that he could handle it with his current mana flow skill. But the rebound was more than he expected, and this made him aware that his doping methods would do him more harm than he thought. Status. Asher spoke. Fate Devourer System. Name. Asher Vaughn Raven Greville. Level 10, EXP 0 slash 10, 0, 0, 0. Bloodline, Devil's Absorption Rank SSS. Blessing, Goddess of Time, Sealed. Body Constitution, Mana Core Rank E. Shop, Quests, Synthesis. Attributes Dash. Strength, 55 plus 5. Agility, 30 plus 6. Endurance, 55 plus 3. Intelligence, 105. Mana, 66 plus 10. Stamina, 47 plus 8. Charm, 60. Fate, 6730. AP 45, SP 18. Skills Dash, Time Dilution, Rank S, LVL 1. Absorption, Rank S, LVL 1. Mana Flow, Rank C. Mana Circulation, Rank A. Rune of Erden, Rank E. Nodart, Rank SSS. He looked at his status noticing some of his stats had gone up due to him ranking up. He did not get any notification because his mana core was currently at E rank, so the system did not consider it a true rank up for him. Young master! Asher heard a scream, and he knew whose voice it was. He turned his head and saw Emmy, who sensed his mana and immediately appeared in front of him. Emmy stopped as she saw Asher, who was on the ground with blood around his mouth. She was confused how Asher got hurt, but she arrived near him to check his condition first. Young master, are you fine? Why are you so deep into this dungeon? Emmy questioned, but she brought a healing potion from her storage ring at the same time. It's fine, I hurt myself trying a new technique that I learned with grandfather, Asher said while his indifferent eyes looked at Emmy. But wait, this cave. Emmy stopped and noticed the cave she was in was surrounded by mana crystals. A man a crystal mine. Emmy was shocked as her eyes looked around her. Her mind was all over the place as too many things were happening at the same time. Asher was too deep into the dungeon and he got hurt in what seemed like an empty cave, 
and the numerous monster carcasses she saw on the way made her wonder how Asher managed to do it. Yes, and there are two caves inside this dungeon. I have already cleared the boss of this dungeon, so tell the guards to make sure nobody enters this dungeon. Asher got up from his place, but he did not take the potion Emmy offered to him. Oh, okay. Wait, what? You cleared the boss? Emmy's eyes widened from the shock as she looked at the indifferent face of Asher, who was clearing the mud off his clothes. I did, and I want to rest now. Take the guards that followed you out of this dungeon. Make sure nobody does anything fishy. Asher moved past her. Okay, Emmy said, but there were many questions in her head. However, it was not her job to ask Asher such things. She knew her limits, and the angry face of Asher was still fresh in her head from when they arrived in the mountain range. Chapter 57 Verne's Going Back Home In Desmar, inside Asteria household, a couple could be seen sitting on a huge dining table eating together. As the man was eating his food, he heard the voice of his wife. It seems that the Greville and Rothschild will have some confrontation in the near future. A beautiful woman with blonde hair and blue eyes told the man who was sitting on the same table as her. Well, the Greville were getting too powerful so this would make sure they don't overstep their limits. The man with red hair replied to her. I was thinking that I should tell Alan to befriend the heir of the Greville during his stay at the World Academy, but this event with Rothschild made me reconsider it. The man spoke. Alex! Don't use our son for such purposes. The blonde woman shouted at him. Use that bitch instead. No need to trouble Alan for such things. She spoke. Calm down, Mia. I was just thinking about creating a friendly relationship with the Greville, but I'm reconsidering it myself. The man calmed his wife down. And you know that girl is useless. I mean, her face is hideous enough that it would strain our relationship with the Greville more than better it. The man told her. Whatever, it's your headache, not mine. The woman stood up and walked out of the room. Sigh. The man sighed as he saw his wife leave the table. T.S.K., this girl is so useless. But Alan befriending that Whiteheart boy doesn't sound too bad as well, the man said. Well, I have seven months to think about it. He stood up after he finished the food and left the table as well. Asher moved out of the cave and looked in the direction where the portal gate was present. He was done with what he wanted to achieve in the dungeon and had also acquired the new sword art, which only time could tell where it would take him. Young master! A couple of guards who were behind Emmy and searching in the cave saw Asher, so they came near him. I am fine. I have given Emmy the orders for now. Follow what she says for now, Asher said with an indifferent face. As you wish. The guards were used to him as they always followed him everywhere. Asher left them, as they informed others who followed them inside the dungeon in their communication devices. Gareth, you take four guys and protect this dungeon until I send more people. Make sure nobody enters the dungeon until I give you guys the confirmation. Emmy told the guards with a serious face. Yes, team leader. The guards replied together. They did not question what the reason behind her decision was, as Emmy was not a simple maid that served Asher. She was a special elite that followed Sylvia, was partially trained by her, and was famous for her reconnaissance skills. This team of guards were trained under Emmy directly as Asher's security. They were all Birank hunters, as this was enough for Asher who would only travel a few times. The Grievilles were sure that nobody was stupid enough to attack them in their own territory called Sorin. Although Sorin also had the World Academy, it was on a floating island, and only the Portal Dome was present in Sorin. So, the influence of the World Academy in Sorin was not stronger than the Grievilles. Asher saw the portal and stepped into it feeling a huge wave of mana rush towards him as he found himself in front of the temporary camp that was set up outside the dungeon gate. The rest of the guards had already received the news of Asher being fine, so they were not surprised to see him walk out casually. Are you fine? Amelia said. She was outside near the gate, 
so she saw Asher walking out of the dungeon gate looking almost fine. Asher looked towards Amelia with his usual indifferent face. Yeah. Asher's same indifferent voice irked Amelia, but she could only take his answer. Where are the twins? Asher asked Amelia. Oh, I think they will wake up soon. Amelia replied to him. Wake them up now. We are leaving. Asher said to Amelia. Okay. Amelia turned and replied to him, but you could tell she was irritated with Asher. Mean bastard. Amelia muttered as she walked towards the camp where the twins were resting. Young master, I have arranged for security to guard this dungeon. Emmy, who came out just moments after Amelia left, said to Asher. I will tell mom and dad about this cave and my plans for it. Make sure news doesn't leak. Asher's gaze turned a bit cold, but Emmy did not seem to be affected by it. As you wish. Emmy was saying something when she suddenly got a notification about a certain piece of information Asher was looking for. Oh, I think we have found the person you described to me weeks ago. Emmy told Asher excitedly. Where is his current location? Asher asked Emmy as he knew what information Emmy was talking about. It says that the person you described is hiding around in Verne's. Emmy replied. Verne's. Asher muttered. He knew that Verne's was another city of Samaria, south of Sorin, and famous for being the city where the World Association Tower was located in Samaria. Every continent had a building for the World Association, and for Samaria, it was Verne's. Bring that man to Sorin, and make sure that nobody gets on your trail during this mission, Asher said to Emmy. This might be a bit tricky due to the World Association dash. Emmy stopped as Asher threw something towards her. Take this emblem of the Raven family and make sure that he gets to Soren soon, Asher said. Emmy looked at the emblem that Asher had taken out of his ring. It was the token that could only be used by VVIP members of the Raven Guild. This was given to Asher by Alfred on his tenth birthday. Okay, I will make sure that the work gets done. Emmy immediately disappeared, leaving Asher alone. Asher sat down and closed his eyes to assess the damage that he had suffered from the doping method. He channeled his mana circulation technique, and he could feel that the stinging pain was gone, but not completely. He could still feel a bit of pain left around his chest region, but it was something that would trouble him greatly. Not that bad, Asher muttered as he opened his eyes. He found that his condition right now did not require him to take a potion to heal the numerous small injuries that he suffered from this method. Lucas, Livia, get up, we are leaving, Amelia said. The twins, who had rested enough, got up without creating any fuss. Hmm, why WN did we win, Lucas? Livia yawned and asked Lucas if they had won. She looked cute worrying about the fight, even though she was quite tired. We did. Lucas brushed his hand on her head, making Livia giggle a bit. Come on, Livia, get up. We need to leave now. You can rest when we get home. Amelia told Livia. Okay, big sis. Livia immediately jumped from her bed as she nodded her head quickly to affirm Amelia. So cute, Amelia thought in her mind, being careful not to speak out loud. Is bro out now? Lucas asked with a low voice. Oh, apparently, he also got hurt and needed Emmy to take him out of the dungeon. Not so strong after all. Amelia cheekily changed the story a bit. It was her form of petty revenge against Asher for his mean attitude. Is he fine? Lucas immediately asked her. Yeah, don't worry. He is outside, so you can see for yourself. Amelia replied to him. The twins saw Amelia leaving so they followed her. Ash, we are ready to go. Amelia came out with the twins and saw Asher standing there, waiting for them. As they moved towards the location of their cars, Amelia noticed that some of their security was missing. Emmy, some of the guys are missing. Amelia turned her head and asked Emmy, who was beside her. They are guarding the dungeon on my order. Before Emmy could answer, Asher replied to her question. Oh, is there any reason for extra people here? Amelia got curious, so she asked Asher. You will know soon enough. Asher sat in the car as the driver opened the door for him. You dash. Amelia muttered quietly but stopped midway and quietly sat in the car. The car left for the mansion, and Emmy also went together with them. 
Lucas was curious about what Asher encountered in the dungeon, so he chose to ask directly. How many of those monsters did you kill? Lucas's eyes shone as he asked Asher. It was a bit weird for a ten-year-old to get excited by the thought of killing monsters, but being a Greville, being a bit insane ran in his blood as well. Don't know, maybe above one hundred, including the boss. Asher looked at him and answered. Wait, you killed the boss? And one hundred plus F rank monsters? Amelia almost screamed but controlled her voice. Chapter 58 Dreams of Past Yeah. Asher looked towards Amelia and replied. Don't joke with me, you are only a Frank, right? Amelia had her mouth open as she could not believe it. Asher took out the artifact he had retrieved from the dungeon altar and threw it towards Amelia. You really did? Amelia looked at the pendant, and from what she had learned until now, she could guess that this pendant was the artifact that Asher had found in the dungeon. Emmy, did he really? Amelia asked Emmy, who was sitting in the front. Yeah, I found the empty dungeon altar, and I saw many dead rock eaters inside. Emmy did not tell her about the missing body of the boss rock eater. She thought that Asher took it as a trophy, as his first dungeon clear, as many people like to collect their first big hunt. Well, Lucas muttered. Big Brother defeated those strong monsters all alone? Livia was also surprised as she had fought one rock eater, and it was quite difficult for her, even with Lucas supporting her. Oh, you did well for G-Rank. Defeating an F-Rank monster at your level is something only talented people can do. Amelia patted her head. He might defeat Kevin and others as well, Amelia thought to herself. At the time when Asher dueled Elena, who was an F-Rank mage, Kevin was already a peak F-Rank who would soon become an E-Rank hunter. Being in the same academy with Kevin in Desmar, Amelia knew how strong Kevin was. There were other talented geniuses as well, but her knowledge of other geniuses was only from rumors. The car arrived at the Greville estate, and all of them got out. Asher was going to rest a bit because his body was tired, although he appeared fine from outside, but he was in pain the whole time. He looked fine to others because he was used to worse pain than this. Lucas and Livia, you guys rest for today, and we can practice more from tomorrow, okay? Amelia told the twins as they stepped out of the car. Okay, Livia replied, and Lucas also nodded with her. I will also go now. Amelia looked at Asher. Sure. Asher turned as Amelia left the living room. He still needed a bath because he was covered in the blood of the rock eaters previously. Although the nano armor was designed to make sure no lingering residue was left, if not for the function of the suit, the twins would have to travel in a different car altogether. The stench of monster blood was strong and was not a pleasant one at all. Asher entered his personal bathroom and took a quick shower. Every trickle of water that touched his body made his sensitive body react due to the small injuries all over his body. Although he looked fine, his body was not used to this type of doping unlike in the past. He could bear the pain, but the nerves made his body react due to his unusual doping method. After finishing the shower, Asher lay back in his bed. It was still afternoon, and he decided to sleep until dinner. His body needed rest, and being tired, he quickly fell asleep. Arg! The black-haired man lying down on a bed woke up, and his red eyes met the man in a lab coat in front of him. He was in a room full of equipment, and some devices attached to his body, displaying his condition. Are you feeling fine? The man in the lab coat asked him. Arg fuck! The black-haired man grabbed his head. What happened? Asher, are you fine? The man in the lab coat rushed and grabbed his hand, supporting Asher in getting up. Where is Lucas? Arg! Asher spoke still grabbing his head. The man in the lab coat did not reply back to his question. Nate? I asked, where the fuck is Lucas? Asher looked up, and his crimson red eyes met Nate, who was just staring towards him. He saved you. Your core was broken, and only he could help you. Nate's voice trembled as he spoke. His eyes looked away from Asher. 
A in doing that, he sacrificed H his life. Nate felt something stuck in his throat. Cough. Nate felt an overflowing bloodlust fill the whole room. He felt as if he were struck by a flood of water. He could not breathe and fell down to his knees. A-R-G-H-G-H-H-H-H. Asher screamed as his head was bursting with pain, his mana was flaring, and its sheer pressure destroyed the many devices around him. Bam! Asher threw the devices connected to his arm, making them hit the wall and splatter into pieces. A hey Asher, wait, don't move. Your body is still recovering. Hearing Nate's voice, the pressure on him eased up a bit, but he still could not get up. Get Tom to get me the location of those people. Asher turned and looked at Nate. Nate was a bit intimidated by his eyes, but he needed to stop Asher. Wait, everybody is still recovering from the last dash. Nate was speaking, but... Shut up. If you want to leave, you can. I will not stop you. Asher left the room as Nate watched him leave helplessly. I think we have made a mistake, Lucas. Nate sat with his back against the wall and closed his eyes. He was too tired as Asher required his constant watch during the recuperation period. Too many people have died already, but I can't stop now. Nate remembered his brother Damien. Months later. Wait, spare my kids? A woman shouted at Asher. No, please no. Her eyes were filled with tears as she saw Asher, who was standing in front of her husband's dead body. Ha 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 ha, and why would I? Asher's red eyes looked at the woman in front of him. No, please leave us alone. The woman hugged her children, fearing the man standing in front of her. Bam. A blast happened, breaking one of the walls in the room, and a man could be seen coming out of the dust. Asher, wait! Nate who saw Asher covered in the blood of multiple people, spoke hurriedly. Asher turned, and his dead-looking red eyes looked towards Nate. No need to kill them. Nate came a bit closer to Asher. Stop right there. Asher raised his sword, pointing it towards Nate. Nate knew that he could not stop Asher. Stop! Do you think she would have been fine looking at you now? Nate wanted to stop Asher from killing more innocent people. Arg! Listening to Nate, a memory arose in the head of Asher, making him lower his sword as an intense headache that could kill any sane person hit him. Sir, we need to evacuate. Two SSS rank hunters have been dispatched. Before Nate could look at Asher, one of their organization members wearing a black mask interrupted them. F-U-C-K, let's leave. Asher turned and decided to leave. Despite the intense pain, he could hear his subordinate's voice clearly and he made the instant decision to leave. Hearing his voice, both Nate and the woman who was beside the dead body of her husband were relieved. Okay. Nate also followed behind Asher as they left the mansion that probably belonged to the dead husband. Boss, the portal is ready. We can leave now. A person in a black mask looked at Asher and said, Let's leave quickly. Nate was leaving but he stopped when he suddenly saw Asher take out his sword. Severing slash. Asher slashed his sword as he turned towards the mansion, and an arc made of mana left his sword. No. Nate was too slow to stop him, and he saw Asher's attack go through the mansion. Why? Nate could not help but ask Asher. She is dead. Don't ever mention her again. This is what I am. Asher's cold voice was heard by Nate as he watched Asher's back. You can leave my side any time you want, but don't ever try all this on me again. Asher's cold gaze stunned even his subordinates, but Nate only had a defeated look on his face. Ho ha ho haa. Asher suddenly got up from his bed, waking up from his dream as he breathed heavily. Arg. He felt a slight headache, but it was gone a few seconds later. Asher looked towards the painting in his room to calm himself down. He looked at the clock and saw that it was almost 7 p.m. in the evening. I should go down. He remembered that he needed to talk to Sylvie about those mines. He got up and decided to change his clothes, as his current ones were soaked in sweat. He left his room and saw Emmy standing in the hallway. What happened? Asher asked Emmy. Ah, uh, Lady Sylvie has arrived and she wanted to meet you when you woke up. Emmy replied, feeling a bit startled by Asher's colder-than-usual aura. Okay, 
Asher said, as he needed to talk to Sylvie about the mines. And the man you asked about, I think we can bring him to Soren in the next three to four days. Emmy completed her report. Make sure this matter remains confidential. Asher instructed Emmy. As you wish, young master, Emmy replied. Chapter 59 Business Talks Asher walked downstairs and headed towards the living room where he saw Sylvie sitting there, wearing a black suit. She had just arrived from the office and hadn't changed yet. Sylvie looked towards Asher, but her mood seemed off. Care to explain? Sylvie's voice was cold as she spoke to Asher. Asher looked at her with an indifferent face. What? he said. I heard you defeated the dungeon boss all by yourself, Sylvie said. Ash, I'm proud of your talent, but such carelessness could lead even a genius like you to your demise. For her, Asher was indeed a genius. His talent had shown his capabilities so far, but in her eyes, he was still a fourteen-year-old child. He might act mature, but in Sylvie's eyes, he was a child who would continue to make mistakes and learn from them. It was her job as a mother to ensure Asher understood the risk. I knew my limits, and I had the safety bracelet as well. Asher didn't want to argue anymore. He couldn't tell her that he wasn't a child who would make rookie mistakes. Sigh. Sit down. Emmy told me that you wanted to talk about something. Sylvie said, changing the topic rather than arguing any further. Yeah, when I explored the dungeons, it was full of rock eaters. But when I approached the last two caves, I found out that they were filled with mana crystals. Asher spoke. What? Sylvie's eyes widened with surprise. If I'm not wrong, that supply could confirm our dominance on the mana stones market. Asher explained. Wait, let me think about it for a second. Sylvie needed some time to think. Finding a mana crystal mine was even rarer than an SS rank mana gem, and currently, there were only four such mines under the direct control of the Greville family, which allowed them to dominate the market. However, some elite families were worried about the increasing economy of the Grievilles, so they decided to band together to put pressure on them. This was the issue that created a headache for Sylvie. She couldn't outright remove the elite families, and competing on a global scale with some elite families interrupting their business didn't help them much. Tell me, what do you want to do with it? Sylvie looked up and asked Asher. I want to break the supply sixty fortieths by selling sixty percent to the Abyss Guild and keeping the rest and creating my own supply chain. Asher told Sylvie. Make it eighty-twenty and you can do it. Sylvie stared at her own son as a smile appeared on her face. Her true nature as a fearsome businesswoman was coming out. She wouldn't even allow her own son to take advantage of her in business. She was called a demon in the business world and her acumen for business was far greater than Asher's, who was a genius himself. You know that I own that dungeon, right? Asher crossed his legs. Oh, my little boy is so cute. Sylvie smiled at Asher, but the next moment, the motherly smile changed. But don't forget that your cute little dungeon is in Soren, and you don't want to experience minor issues, right? Sylvie was half-joking, but the mana crystal mine was not something she would blindly give to Asher who was still a child. She did not bat an eye at Asher spending a huge amount of one billion AUR for his personal use because she knew that he was smart enough to make something out of it. She had seen her son's intelligence in such fields as he grew up. Both Sylvie and Arthur would make Asher actively participate in their business talks during dinner and test him. Seventy thirtieths, I will not lower it more than this. Asher knew the nature of his mother and her own talent in business and her capabilities as well. If he did not need some of his own independent funds for his future plans, he would have agreed with Sylvie. Oh my! Sylvie put her hand on her mouth, acting surprised and childishly. Sigh, alas, it was true that children cut off their poor parents as they grow up, Sylvie said as she fake wiped tears from her eyes. She looked at Asher and saw his same indifferent face. He was not one bit affected by her little performance. Tisk, okay, you have a deal. I will send the contract to Emmy, 
Sign it when you receive it. Sylvie ended her little charade and agreed to a deal. Okay, I might skip dinner today as I need to continue my training. Asher stood up, and Sylvie also stood up. Training is good, but don't forget to rest, okay? Sylvie walked and said as she kissed Asher on the forehead with her hands on his shoulder. I will, Asher assured and left the room, leaving Sylvie alone. Something was off about him, maybe because of his first dungeon run. I should give him some time. Sylvie could notice that Asher's vibe was a bit different. She wanted to lighten up the mood, so she played around with him like that. In a small apartment room in Vern's, a man sat in front of his computer amidst snacks and a messy room. He wore glasses, had black hair, and an average face. He typed away on his system, muttering to himself, Manager, I am sorry, but we have decided to continue without you on board. I wish you the best and appreciate your hard work throughout. Damn it, these fucking bastards, the man grumbled. I worked on this project for a month, and now they cut me off like that. He flung the bottle at the wall. Arg, I need to pay the bill this month as well. He stood up from his chair, frustrated. This damn world can't understand talent like me. He was exhausted from applying to numerous jobs and being rejected due to not being a hunter and a social person. Beep. He received a notification on his phone and decided to check it out. Sarah brother, you haven't called me in a week. Is everything okay? Ha, what should I even tell her? He massaged his head as he walked around his small apartment room. Tom O, oh, I was just applying for some jobs. I might find one soon and finally get some funds for my cute little nephew. Sarah, I've said it before, but you don't need to shoulder all these problems alone. Have some rest. I'm sure it will get better in the future. Tom, Sarah, I'll chat with you later. I received a work-related text. Sarah, oh, sure. But don't forget to take care of yourself. Tom, I know, take care. Bye. Sigh, it's so difficult to work for the World Association. He threw his phone on his bed. Why did I even come to the city? He looked up at the ceiling remembering the time he came to find a job at the World Association. His application was rejected multiple times because he was not a capable hunter according to their standards, and his poor background did not help him much. Should I just give up? He looked out of his window and saw many people happily walking around. He was a young man in his mid-twenties, but he could not enjoy his life like other people. He was jealous but he needed to earn for his sister who was a single mother with an ill son suffering from a disease that required a lot of money and good facilities. What am I even thinking? I should just apply for another job, he said to himself as he sat back on his chair and started scrolling through job portals. Ding ding. He heard the bell of his apartment and stopped typing. Fuck, why is that fat bastard ringing my bell? It's not even the end of the month yet. He muttered as he annoyingly got up from his chair and went towards his door. Ding ding. Chill, man, I am coming, he shouted. Sir, it's not even the end of the month yet, and I have told you I will give the last month's payment next. He opened the door saying something but stopped midway. Who are you guys? He was confused as he saw two men with black clothes and glasses standing in front of him. Are you Mr. Tom Gilips? One of the men with a deep voice asked him. Em, yes, I am, but can I know why you need me? He was a bit intimidated by them. Oh, we need you to come with us, the man behind him spoke. What are you? Tom was saying something when he suddenly felt something hit the back of his head, knocking him out. Don't waste time chatting. We need to complete this mission fast. A third man with a mask on his face appeared behind Tom and was holding his unconscious body. Come on, I had one more line I wanted to say. One of them spoke. Make sure you delete any footage that might trace this man. The masked man spoke. Okay. Both men replied. Chapter 60 Meeting Tom Gilip Sylvia had discussed the Mana Crystal Mines with Arthur. He was shocked by her announcement. 
Even Amelia was shocked by what she heard. Asher was not here as he was training, so he heard about it from Sylvie. So, that's why he left those guards there, Amelia thought. The twins were just listening and acting as per the mood around the table because they did not know the value of this mine. But they thought it must be an expensive thing if they were so surprised by it. And you are telling me he defeated the E-rank boss himself? Arthur asked Amelia, who was eating her dinner. Yeah, as per Emmy, Amelia spoke. I already warned him to be more careful next time. Sylvie spoke. Wait, why I mean, good job. Arthur almost slipped up. He mistook Asher as a battle freak, so he was a bit happy. Of course he is so talented, just like me. Arthur made a smug face in his mind but did not speak it out loud. He knew that Sylvie would not be happy about it. But I am surprised you let him off with thirty percent of the mine, Arthur said. Humph, he would have gotten sad if his own mother bullied him. Sylvie spoke in her childish manner. Livia chuckled, seeing Sylvie like this, and even Lucas was smiling, seeing her. Amelia, who knew the nature of her mother, just shook her head. They discussed a few more things as the dinner continued. Nathan had already left and gone back for guild-related work. Two days later, Asher was coming out of his training, and he saw Emmy, who was waiting for him outside. Young master, that person has arrived in Soren. Emmy spoke. What's the location? Asher removed his gear and put it back in his storage ring. We have kept him in the villa under the Greville name that was gifted to you some years ago. Emmy said as there was nobody present, so she could discuss it openly. I will get ready, arrange the car, but don't take any security with us. Asher told Emmy. Okay, young master. Emmy accepted his request. In a big villa that was a bit far from the center of Soren, some men wearing black masks could be seen patrolling and making sure no intruder could enter. Ugh! Tom regained his consciousness, but he felt like somebody put so much weight on his head. Where am I? Tom couldn't properly open his eyes, but he tried to make sense out of his surroundings. Ugh, what happened? Tom squinted his eyes as he looked around to find himself in a white room. He was tied down to a chair. What day is it? Tom looked around for some clue. The last thing he remembered was speaking to his sister and meeting some strange men, and now he was in this situation. Hey, is anybody here? He shouted, but nobody answered him. He had no sense of time, and he could not make sense out of this situation. Hello? Why am I here? Tom kept shouting, but he stopped when he got no response. Did they find out? Tom's heart was beating out loud, making all sorts of conclusions about his current situation. Click. He heard a sound and saw a teenager with black hair and sharp crimson red eyes coming out with a woman with brown hair following him. Who are you guys? Tom hurriedly asked. Calm down, your name is Tom Jilip, right? Asher spoke. Yeah, but tell me Dash. Tom was speaking but Asher's cold gaze intimidated him. It would be better if you let me do the talking, Tom Jilip. Asher's aura was quite intimidating these days, and even Emmy could notice it. Asher knew about it, so he also skipped eating together with his family for the past few days by telling them he was busy training. Emmy, go out. Asher turned and looked towards her. Uh, okay as you wish, young master. Emmy agreed and left the room. The room they were in was protected by soundproofing runes, so nobody could hear what was happening inside. Let's introduce ourselves first. Asher sat down on an empty chair that was present in front of Tom. Tom Jilip, age 22, a tech enthusiast looking for a job. Asher read out from the information he was reading from the hologram of his watch. Per background, rejected by the World Association three times, no capabilities as a hunter. Asher finished and looked towards Tom, who was silently staring at him. What do you want from me? Tom looked Asher dead in the eyes and asked. I know you have the capabilities of a capable hacker, and I want you to do work on certain things for me. Asher spoke. I don't know what you think of me, but I am a normal software developer, and I have no skills for the things you need me for. Tom tried to reason with Asher. Even in the report that Asher had gotten from the Information Guild, 
There was no mention of Tom having any skills for the work Asher was probably asking from him. Three times you have cleared the World Association passing criteria and have gotten rejected in the interview. Asher's words made Tom's face go pale. But if you look at this carefully, each time your profile was selected from the database despite getting rejected previously. Asher continued. Not so weird if you asked me, but strangely after your last attempt, World Association, for the first time, faced a spyware threat in their system, but luckily for them, they managed to stop it. Tom's heart rate was going up. Sweat was forming on his forehead, and his hands were shaking. The common public might not know about that spyware attack, but the upper echelon was aware of it. Although World Association is still finding the culprit, the traces were carefully erased. Asher stopped. I don't know what you are talking about. Tom knew that Asher's claim could not be proven. I deleted everything. Nobody can trace it back to me, he spoke in his mind. I will repeat it again, so don't waste my time. You will work for me from now on. Asher's indifferent attitude and his cold gaze made Tom feel intimidated by him. What will I benefit from working with you? Tom decided to negotiate with Asher. Ha! Huh. Asher breathed out and stared back at Tom. Do you think I am asking you to work for me? Asher said. Tom could feel that the atmosphere around him was getting a bit cold. Sarah Gilep, single mother working miscellaneous jobs to raise funds for her son, and her only brother, Tom Gilep, trying to get into World Association for their world-class medical facilities. Asher kept speaking. Time it took me to bring you to Soren was a couple of days, and trust me, for me to kill someone, all I need is a few hours. Asher's indifferent eyes made Tom shiver. I will do it, Tom shouted. I will do whatever you want, just leave Sarah alone. Tom's eyes were almost tearing up. He did not know how Asher managed to find out his secret. He had indeed made a spyware, but his limited resources did not allow him to do any damage to the World Association. He did all this because he was full of anger towards the policies of the World Association of not allowing people like him, who did not have any talent for becoming a hunter. But after doing this, he was scared that he might get killed or arrested, so he decided to bury his past and find a normal job to support his sister. He desperately needed the medical facilities of the World Association because that was his only option to cure his nephew, but not being a hunter and getting rejected as an employee, he was at his lowest. He needed large funds, and he had no way of securing them. Let's not do anything illegal from now on. Tom decided from that moment that he would not misuse his talent as a hacker because the risk was too large, and he had no backing to support him and he knew that carelessly going around speaking of his skills might attract many shady organizations that hired people like him. He knew that some of those organizations or rich families killed others after using them to make sure there were no loose ends. Asher clicked on his watch, and Emmy came in with a tablet in her hands. Sign the contract and make sure you read all of the terms. And of course, no negotiations will be allowed. Asher got up and left Tom who was thinking what has he done so bad to deserve to be treated like this. Sniff I have to sign it, right? Tom looked at Emmy, who was confused about why a grown man was tearing up like this. Yeah. Emmy gave him the contract. Tom took the tablet and started reading the terms, and as he kept reading, his eyes went wide with shock. I will get this much money. Tom knew what amount people like him would get if they worked for them but the amount Asher offered him was ten times that. Yes, and we will fly your family to Soren and handle their treatment. Emmy meant that Asher would sponsor both the hospital facilities and keep watch over them just in case Tom got any funny ideas against him. Okay, I will sign it. Tom hurriedly signed the contract, confirming his information and completing the required paperwork. Asher was outside, talking with one of the black-masked men. This might be a bit risky, young master, the black-masked man said. Don't worry, just inform me if anything related to it happens, but don't let grandmother know about it. Asher spoke. Um, I can't promise the guild master would not know about it. The black-masked man scratched his head. Don't create a mission for my request, just pass me any information related to it. Asher said and left the man. Strange, meeting Tom should have given me some fate points. 
Asher said to himself as he sat in his car. The host does not have enough authority, but encountering something significant enough to impact your destiny can earn you fate points.